Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great, and great is to be praised. He is to be feared of all. Get to do us, the announcements today. Um, welcome to the official Harvest Home of 2024. We are really glad you're here, and I know that this is going to be a fantastic day. And I just encourage you to just really get into it and enjoy it because uh, there's a lot of neat things planned. I'm going to. I can find what they gave me. Do the announcements. If you are a first-time visitor, we have a gift for you. Please be sure to pick up uh, at the information booth uh, in the lobby after the service. Plan to be involved with our Harvest Home celebration today. Um, I think Don was going to do this, so I'll let him do that part at the end. Uh, uh, Billy Graham Evangelical Association was... Uh, published, has published a 2024 election guide. Copies are available in the information booth. This is very helpful for those of you who have questions. Um, a new members class will be held Wednesday evening, October 16th and uh, 23rd. From 6 a.m. of oh, 6, no, 6 p.m., sorry. It's not that long, don't worry. Uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Okay. Please contact Pastor Britt if you would like to be a part of this class. 
Okay, be, be sure to read your uh, bulletin for any other uh, details that you're looking for, uh, and you'll find a lot of things. And there's, off, for those who are, want to give offering this morning, there's offering boxes in the, in the foyer. Okay. And this time, you know, I, I, I love these flags going around the, 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 the auditorium. I, I just look at them, I think, of all these countries that are represented. I don't know, obviously, there are much more countries than, than these, and I haven't sat down to, to count all the different countries represented, but, you know, when I think about all these countries uh, represented by these flags, I think of, you know, the thousands, pro hundreds of thousands, millions of people represented by these flags. And these, these people are the people that need the Lord, right? These are the people that God, when he, when he said, when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach a gospel to every creature, he was thinking about these people here. And it also made me think about in heaven, in the Revelation, it says that John, when he was up in heaven, he said, he said he saw people from every nation and every tribe, and every tongue, there in heaven. It said innumerable. There's going to be a lot of people up there praising God. And so in our worship service, it's just a, a little foretaste of the uh, amazing, amazing beauty of worshiping Jesus when we get to heaven, where all nations and all tribes will be represented. There's one of our missionaries that, that First Baptist Church has supported for many years, and she is retiring, and I want to invite uh, Deborah Brown up. We want to do a special thank for Deborah. <laughs> Give me a Okay, let's see. Speaking of flags. Speaking of flags. Okay. Italy. Italy. Now, did you guys know the Italian flag? Um, it might be good to look around not during, not during the message, <laughs> but see how many flags that you recognize. Okay. Well, I, I've made some questions for you, Deborah, here, and uh, I'm not sure exactly how, how long if we'll have time to do all of them. But how, my first question is, how old were you when you first felt you were called to be a missionary? I gave my life to Christ July 5th, 1970. First time anybody ever asked me, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? And from that point, I had this burden in my heart, in my life, to tell those who didn't know the name Jesus. And that was way back at Laternal College in Longview, Texas. That's amazing. You went to Laternal. That's a, that's a great college. Yeah, there was a little boy named... Franklin Graham sat right beside me in three of my classes freshman year. Honestly, I think I, I recognize that name. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, praise God. Some, some great beginnings. So how long have you been a foreign missionary? Uh, I've just, as of this week, I guess officially I'm retired uh, as of today. It's been, uh, uh, how long has it been? 26, 26. years, 26 years. Now, uh, when did you get back? You just were in Italy. I got back one o'clock Saturday morning, so. One o'clock, that's pretty recent, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So how long were you missionary in, in Italy? 20, 26 you years 26 in, in, Italy. in Italy, and since 2018, I've also been going to Ethiopia for about three months a year. Wow, I bet Italy has a real pl special place in your heart. Yes, and in my tummy, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, yeah. Yeah, you know, we were missionaries for 20 years, 20 years in France, and we, of course, loved the French cuisine very much. But I did an evangelism in, uh, in Italy during the uh, Winter Olympics and tried a lot of Italian food, and I thought, man, I've been kind of closed-minded there a little bit. <laughs> Italian food is amazing. So, uh, uh, so my next question is, how many churches in Italy have you helped or partnered with? I, I've worked with close to 250 different churches over these years. My role is to train and equip Italian believers and also Ethiopians in use of media tools to reach their nation for Christ. We started live streaming before there was such a thing as YouTube. There was barely Google. In 2003, 
Wow. We were live streaming and had between six and 700 people watching live every Sunday, the service that I was working with Praise them. God. So I, I, one of my questions was, how many people have you trained in, in this ministry? It, it's upwards in, into probably between 12, 1,300 people that I know of. Wow, I thought it was gonna be 12 or 13. That's, no, no. That's pretty amazing, wow. So um, uh, now you've made movies, you've done movies, filmed movies and produced them. How many have you done? Uh, most of them are uh, uh, done in Italy that we've actually produced from the ground up are short films. They're half hour or less, which is what you need to if you're gonna do in church. So yeah. there's probably only been like 250 of those. Only? Over, over the years. Uh, feature films, I also was the one responsible for a ministry called Fede Films, Faith Films, and we did distribution of everything from the cross and the switchblade to all the Moody films, uh, to the most recent one was Faith Like Potatoes came out of oh, South yeah. Africa. Yeah, I know that one. I uh, did lots of those, so those were the feature films, but th those were the big expense to try to translate and dub. So we abandoned those and started making just Italian films. Okay, that's amazing. I, I'm, I'm standing, I know Deborah, but I don't think I knew all those numbers. That's amazing. Uh, what, now this, is a, this is the next to last question, and uh, I know it's probably gonna be a hard one to answer, so <laughs> give it a good try. Uh, what were a couple of the highlights in, uh, in your mission work and some of your fondest memories? Um, highlight being, uh, we, we produced one film, um, the first time we produced one to be shown in America, but it was in Italian. It was called um, Cinque Minuti, Five Minutes, based on Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You must first believe that he exists and rewards those who diligently seek him. And that film has now been translated, we know of, of 22 languages, seen by over 25 million people. It's won over a dozen international film festivals and it was shown at the Cannes Film Festival in France in 2007. Uh, the last language that I, when I look at all these flags, we got a lot of them. The last two we did in Hebrew and in Farsi, which is the language of Iran. So that, that film is, is just oh. a, a great thing to have been part of. I produced, directed, edited, and did everything for those kind of things. I was not the actor. You don't want me acting there. That um, is amazing. And, wow, praise God. And, the, and that's been the encouraging. And the second part of, uh, of this thing, the gal who was in that film, uh, I did three films with her. Um, she died. Um, just now been 10 years ago of cystic fibrosis uh, uh, for lack of a, another heart transplant. She made it to 38. At her funeral, she was a very famous actress and, and model. Uh, at, at her funeral, um, which was in a Catholic church, her mom was Catholic, we asked the priest, can we hand out this DVD of Cinque Minuti? And he said, what, what is this film? I don't know what that is. He didn't know who the girl was in the coffin. And uh, we explained to him the story of what it is. And he said, wait a minute, this is the story of a girl on a bridge who's gonna commit suicide and Jesus comes to talk to her. He said, I use that film. If someone, if a couple comes to me for marriage counseling, I make them watch that film. He didn't know who was in the coffin. I still get goosebumps. Just this is the truth that we handed out 600 DVDs at her funeral. and. God, even when we're gone, uh, our testimony lives on. And, and to me, that's the exciting thing. I'm done in, in, in Italy. My name's not on that list. There were 20, now there's 19 missionaries on the list. Uh, I'm, I'm done. But uh, to know that even from this point forward, the people that I've trained and equipped, my Timothys, I always tell my people, yeah. get a Timothy. Yes and it will go forward after you're gone, or after you're done. So that's, wow. that's, that's my story, Praise I'm God. sticking to it. You know, when I think about uh, missionaries, and anybody who has actually shared cries with a lot of people, served the Lord faithfully all their lives, I think about the people that will be in heaven, you know, because of, of people, like Deborah. And I know she doesn't want to be glorified, and we're not glorifying her at all. But I just praise God, and lo looking back on, on her life, uh, it's really uh, inspirational, isn't it? Well, how, how can we pray for you, Deborah? I need a reason. I've, I've, my whole purpose since, I've been widowed for 43 years and when my youngest went off to Bible college, I went to Italy. Now he and his family are in their eighth year in missions in Bolivia. 
they've got their role in ministry at this stage in their life. I'm now, you know, when I hit 70, it hit back, and now I'm in my mid-70s, and I've got to find a a reason to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know God lets me share things as I can, but I'm looking for a place of service, wherever that might be at this season of my life. So Mm -hmm. that's what I'm praying for. Okay. Great. Thank you, Deborah. Let's let's pray right now. Uh, Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Deborah and her uh, her, her, her testimony. Thank you for bringing her t- to yourself and uh, calling her into full-time work. Uh, wow, just I thank you for just the opportunity she had to, to bless people with her gifts and her talents and to, and to speak of you wherever she goes. And uh, now, Lord, I just pray that you will um, bless her, give her wisdom. Uh, she asked for that she will have a, a, a find a, a new purpose a uh, reason for being here uh, right now, and she says uh, her work is done, but I know missionary's work never seems to finish, and uh, so I just pray that you just give her wisdom, give her direction, and bless her for all her work, and give her some good rest right now after having worked so hard in Italy. God, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Thank Would you stand with me as we read the verse of the month? As we focus on Harvest Home, this verse is meant to get us to focus in on the mission of Christ. So as we say it together, it's, it's really kind of a confession of what we believe and what we know we receive from Christ. Will you say with me? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth, Acts 1.8. Now you take a moment and greet those people around you.
Good morning, church. Let's remain standing and let's sing some praise to the Lord this morning. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad. verse for our come to worship time so let's read this part together i am speaking, speaking in human terms because, because of your natural limitations for just as you once presented your members as slaves, slaves to impurity and, and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification romans 6:19 Father, we thank you and we give you praise for the, the work that is being done in your name in our neighborhoods, our families, our schools, um, our country, and our churches, Lord, and we pray for these um, families, these individuals that are on the mission field. Father, you have called us all to be on mission, to share your good news of eternal life through Jesus Christ, your son. Lord, thank you for today and this opportunity to, um, to know the work that you are doing and to join together in thanks to the lion, the king, the lamb that was slain, and our Savior Jesus, your precious name. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He is roaring with power and fighting our battles every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him 
open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He is roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Father, you are the only one worthy of praise, and we pray that we would take our eyes off of ourselves this morning and turn them to you. <laughs> praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Here I am again. You know, uh, we just prayed for Deborah when we talked about the, her life of ministry. But, you know, when people were, when missionaries retire, we have to replace them, right? You know, Jesus said in Matthew, seeing the crowd, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast. I, downcast I think about these flags and the crowd like sheep without a shepherd and Jesus said um, to his disciples the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few therefore plead with the Lord of harvest to send out workers into his harvest that should be our, our main prayer and I think Pastor Brett was saying you know we want to be a sending church we want a church, and, and I, I praise God that this church supports uh, 20, now 19, 19 uh, missionaries. That's wonderful, isn't it? I think we do have a very missions-minded church, and I'm just thankful for that. Uh, but, and, and today we're going to learn about some of these missionaries who are really young, just out of, I mean, we got some really young ones, and we just praise God because these are the ones that are going to jump in there. And, and jump up to the plate and can, uh, begin the, a work that, uh, that needs to be replaced by missionaries that retire. So that is wonderful. And some of those young, young missionaries uh, are Chris and Chrissy Bryant. And they're, Brian, uh, and they're just wonderful people. Kenny and I had the privilege of knowing them when we were working in, in Germany. Uh, Candy was a teacher at the same school where, where Brian is a teacher, and I, well, Chris is, why did I do that? <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know if he's going to tell any of your story, but I know that him and his wife met at, at Black Forest Academy, and they have been serving the Lord at, uh, at Black Forest Academy for quite a while. So, uh, Chris, why don't you come up, and uh, God bless you. So let's see. All right, the mic's going. The sound crew up there is awesome. Um, I'm going to throw them for a loop in a second. Um, so Freddie said, bring up a flag. And I'm like, oh, I have a flag. It took me forever, but I finally found the Germany flag back there too. But this is a Germany flag. You guys can hang it up in the youth room wherever. Um, it's not out here, so you can have this. Um, I actually teach. I forgot to put that down. Thank you. I forgot, I actually teach graphic arts and yearbook um, at the school I'm at, and one of my assignments is they have to study a flag of a country that they're associated with or like, and then they share the meaning of the colors and, and the meaning of the shapes on the flag. Like, you'll see some of these shapes. Each one of those shapes typically has a meaning that's important to that country or that culture. And so after that, then they come up with their own flag. They can make it either for their dorm that they're in or their family flag or whatever. Um, and so flags mean a lot. And so 
I'm not quite sure what the rules are for Germany, but I don't think they're as tight as America. So like if this was an American flag, I'd be all kinds of careful with it right now. But um, I'll put this over here. All right, um, let me start with prayer before we get going, and then um, it's gonna be a speed run because I think up until about 10.30, 35-ish, uh, 10.40, sounds good. Dear God, um, thank you for being ever-present, not just in one little church, but in all the churches around the globe right now. Um, people have been worshiping you all day, sometimes on Saturdays, sometimes throughout the week. Um, Thank you for being there for each one of us and each one of these churches. Be with those in, in countries that are at war right now. Um, be with the individuals that are dealing with, with hardships here as well as abroad and um, comfort them and send people that, that are not just someone there to pray but also hands and feet that can provide um, housing, shelter, food, um, a warm blanket, uh, a hug, some medicine, to them. Um, thank you for all the people that even um, First Baptist is involved with and is supporting to be part of those um, groups. Thank you again for this time and bless the words that, that you've given me. Help them to really touch someone's heart and um, see what you can do with that in your name. Amen. All right. Um, first, let's start off with who I am and um, my better half. <laughs> The other half of me is in Germany right now, and she would tell me, you need to speed up, you need to slow down. She'd kick me on the side there, and that my, that's my regulator, and I have no regulator now, so watch out. Um, so my son, Jonathan, he's a junior. Um, he's trying to figure out where to go, and, and Idaho seems like a really cool place, and he's going to graduate in a year, and who knows where he'll end up, but um, it's cool to have places that we can call the other homes, and see that. Joshua's a um, ninth grader now. He loves trains. And Sarah's a 10th, 10-year-old. Uh, <laughs> feels like she's going to 10th grade, but she's a 10-year-old that loves gymnastics and all kinds of stuff, and she's now in middle school. Um, Chrissy teaches math, and I teach graphic arts in yearbook at Black Forest Academy. So you can go to the next slide. Um, Black Forest Academy, some of you guys may have heard of it over the last couple of months and even um, in small groups that I've met with this week. It's a missionary kids school or just third culture kids school. It's not even just missionary kids, but third culture kids. So people that have parents that work in all kinds of places around the world globally or in the region that we're in in Germany or in, in Europe. And um, it's, it allows the students to have an education if they wouldn't otherwise have one. Um, it's either too dangerous to be where, they are, where their parents are at or, or there's a, an educational situation that's not working out for the students or situations like that. Um, it's a small little town, and we can go back. It's a small little town in Germany, and the, the, the building started out as, as from a factory. The original foundation of Black Forest Academy was almost like a homeschool situation where the founding group, the Jantz brothers, ended up having, having their kids, and they needed a home teacher, and then other mission boards. Actually, there's two Avant missionaries here in the back today, and they joined, a Gospel Missionary Union joined this homeschool group, and then it grew into an official school, and it's been that since 1956. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this is a typical cross-section of some of our students, but I look at those faces, and I recognize none of them have the same passports. Yes, they might have the American one, but then they also either have a visa or a passport to any of those other places and languages. Go next slide. Um, PFA serves about 130 families, that's actually a larger number now in about 60 countries, um, in about 140 families. A lot of ministries or parents have moved based on the conflicts that are going on right now in the region of BFA and actually have moved from helping the, the people groups that they work with in those countries to helping those same people groups that they work with in Germany now, because Germany has taken on a, a ton of refugees, and so it's Ukrainian, Arabic, um, it's Russian, it's all these different languages that have refugees in Germany, and we have all these missionaries that can't be in the countries that they were hoping to be in, are now in our region, and their kids are coming to our school. And so they're home students, but it's also a boarding school. All right, let's move on to the first part. What do you guys think of when you think of missions? Some people think of, oh, it's just this pastor in the bush, right? Well, 
I think by now you've already heard um, Deborah speaking about, well, wait a minute, I do videos. Well, we need video people. Um, it's almost like a, like a career day at, at, at school when you talk about, my dad does this, my mom does this. Well, imagine any job that you could imagine, and I talked about this with the youth last week, um, any job that you could imagine is most likely one that is needed on the field. And if it's not on the field, it's needed here as well. Because sometimes I know a lawyer friend that she interacts with people that would never hear about God unless they met a lawyer friend. Um, so it could be church planting, it could be outreach ministries, it could be medical ships. Who's here heard of medical ships? They travel around the oceans and then go, po go to port and help whatever group they can reach from the ship or the port. Cultural literacy, um, becoming a slave to meet the loss. That what happened with the Moravians. I'll talk about them in a second. Um, all those different groups, even the, the Jans team that started Black Forest Academy, they were a music group. And, um, and later on, we'll talk about Paul and, and Mars Hill. I'm gonna, again, we're gonna speed run through this stuff now. Um, one of the first verses that normally comes to mind is Matthew 28, and it's the Great Commission verse. And again, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but what are we familiar with? Go therefore and make disciples to, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What, what stands out, it's sort of the very beginning of that phrase, make disciples of all nations. It's not make disciples of Americans, it's not make disciples of the Jews, it's not make disciples of one specific group, all nations. It's global, it's everybody. And that's something to, that stands out in my mind, even with that verse. And when I look at these flags, and when I have my students share about these flags, it's so cool to see their heart just come alive when they're sharing about the country that they're in. Acts 1.6, that's another one that everybody's familiar with. And um, the verse that I, I pulled out of it, out of the entire one, you can always take a screenshot of these or whatever and then look at the entire context. Don't just look at one verse in the Bible. Always read the whole thing. You will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the one we read this morning, but it keeps on talking about other parts too. There's more than just, hey, you're gonna be sent in all these places. Um, last week, Pastor Brett talked about the body of Christ. Um, we are that body, but what does that look like? Um, I've been able to share with the, the small groups this week, and it's been such a joy to hear how they responded to Pastor Brett's message. And you guys have, it's amazing. I, I love how, you, how the points are super detailed, and everybody's like really into all the, the, the points that he made, because he did like three messages worth in one message. I was, I was flabbergasted. Um, but the body of Christ, we sometimes think this is all that there is, right? As we see one part of it. And hopefully today, you're gonna see a little bit of the historical parts of the body of Christ and then some other limbs and fingers and joints and then say, oh, I can plug in here. I can be over here. And, and we can all help each other out in that sense. Um, gifts and talents. Y you might have been thinking, I'm, okay, there's several high schoolers here. You might be thinking, well, what if I don't, when, what if I want to be an engineer or a movie maker? You, you can be an engineer and a movie maker in missions. All right. Um, one of the things that God put on my heart when I first heard about sharing is Paul was actually asked in the, in, in the past, he, one of the things he did, he did this twice in, in Acts 15, 4, it says it, and in Acts um, 21, he went back to Jerusalem to share what was going on in the field with the people in Jerusalem. He actually brought money back with him because the field at the time was helping out Jerusalem because they were persecuted like nobody's business at home. And so the mission service, helping each other out, went both ways. And he actually got into all kinds of trouble bringing the news of the Gentiles coming to God to Jerusalem, that the Pharisees were like not having any of it. And so there's one of the parts, and I'm, I'm just gonna summarize that, but when they came to Jerusalem, they welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done to them. And then, then it was an encouragement to them, right? Um, but then he later kept on talking, and then the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were not happy with what he was allowing Gentiles to do, and so they wanted to go and flog him. Well, in, in the rest of the story is he ended up pulling out the I'm a Roman citizen card, 
And that reminds me a lot of my students. My students are growing up in all these countries and have passports and visas to these places. They can pull out a, well, I'm from this country card. You can't kick me out. Um, or I'm this or that. And, and he was actually, at first, apparently, he was talking not in Aramaic, but in, in, a, in one of the countries, languages that was represented. And so people didn't even realize he was actually from his hometown. And that was interesting, too. Okay, let's keep on going. Um, why, why is there even this thing to spread around the gospel? And I'm going to follow a pattern. Um, if you've heard of Perspectives, it's a program to really get people introduced to what the Bible says about, about missions and just in general to get a big overview. And so I'm going to kind of use that pattern. And you can go to the next slide and break it down. What does the Old Testament say about um, missions in general, just reaching the nations. And we have all these verses, you're salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. We have those verses. It's earth and world. It's not America, it's not Kansas, it's not anything. It's the whole place, right? How, are, how we, can we see the early church acting? And some of that should inspire you. It's like, wait a minute, if they did it, could I be that person that could be called to do that too? And sometimes it's situational. It's not even what you intend to do. Um, then what's the current state of the need? I found some really cool websites, and some people in my environment have, have directed me into these um, websites, and you can research those um, ad nauseum. So we're going to show those. And then what stories is God touching in your life? Um, in the, the lives of people around, like we just heard one from Deborah, but I'm going to kind of summarize and paraphrase a couple stories that I'm directly connected to because of the work I do at Black Forest Academy. We have parents coming in and out all the time, and then they share, oh yeah, we just did this last week, or the ministries that are in our, in our town because of our school, oh, we're heading out to do this right now, or we're going to the refugees in, in Greece. Um, and then I'm going to conclude it by bringing it back to us. Where is your mission field? Is it, is it, is it just, oh, I'm sending money to these people over there, or can it be the grocery store outside of this town or outside of this building. All right, so what does the, um, the Bible say? And we're going to go to Genesis 12. And for sake of time, because I'm going to speed run this, I'm going to just go with the highlights. Um, there's, there's a blessing and a curse that goes here. And the, he's talking to Abraham at the time. It's like, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who will bless you, and, I will dis and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, what's, what are they talking about? Well, later Jesus will come out of those genealogies. So there's a part of just saying you're going to be part of something no matter what you do, and the people around you, no matter what they do, there's going to be a blessing out of this. And, and Stephen, um, in the New Testament, in Acts 7, he's recounting that story, and he's giving an, an explanation as to why he's doing and saying what he's doing about Jesus, and then he got stoned. Guess who was there when Stephen got stoned? Paul, and he was called Saul at the time, and that's in Romans 4. Um, he, Paul then references, talking about the faith of Abraham, and how we can have a faith in Jesus. So it's all kind of tied together. Those events kind of link through each other, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the references to Genesis 12. Um, I'm going to speed run through another one, First Chronicles 16. Um, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. It's a constant reminder, even to the Jews, it's not about you guys, it's about the nations, it's about the nations. The nations should see God. And I don't think I have a slide for this, but Psalms 33, 8, let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Psalms 47, clap your hands, all peoples, or all nations. Um, as your name of God, so your praises reach to the ends of the earth. Um, Psalms 86, um, 9, all the nations who have made you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and you shall glorify your name. Those are almost like the songs we sang this morning. Um, there's recently someone made a point that the, the, the stories you read in the Bible, they're not stories. They're accounts. They are historical documentation of these. Um, Jonah, for instance, was told to go to another country and warn a foreign king of impending doom and, and if they didn't change their ways. 
and he was then mad when it didn't turn out the way he had planned or hoped for when God spared that foreign nation. How often do we get caught thinking, oh, I wish something bad about that person, and then God does like, nope, didn't happen. I'm like, and then we need to remember, well, we would be toast too if we actually were, were judged the way God should judge us. Um, um, over the last couple of days, I've been sharing about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, and Esther, and Mordecai. Their stories, we remember them, those accounts. We remember those accounts because it was the political uprising. They're enslaved. They're all this drama. And then these guys get stuck in a fiery furnace or they almost get eaten by lions or they're supposed to be killed by the king and then they don't. And then there's a political uprising there. And, and the guy reads stuff off of the wall. And how is that even possible? And why is he even talking to the king? And all those things. And we're going, oh, that's amazing. But what were they doing? They were just enslaved against their will. Then they're like picked, okay, you're going to be helping the king out. Or, um, yeah, you're a cool virgin, you're pretty, let's take you into this household. None of those things were planned or expected on their part, right? And so they ended up in these situations that they didn't even ask for. And, and sometimes we, we are like, well, I'm going to avoid any situation where I'm not going to get in trouble. Well, okay, great. Sometimes you're going to get in places just because of who you are or because God plans it to happen that way. And then what did they do? They're like, well, they got to a point, I can't do anything but stand here for God. Luther had that happen to him too. Um, even Ruth, Joseph, Moses, I heard from pastor that you guys are going to go through a series of biblical leaders. Well, half the time the leaders never chose these jobs. Um, Moses even, especially him. It's like, I can't speak. Okay, I give you a helper. Um, all those situations, it was like half the time the people didn't want this. And or they were in prison waiting for something to happen. Twelve years, then the baker doesn't show up for Joseph. And then the other guy doesn't show up. And he's like, dude, you should have gotten me out. Nothing happened. Um, and then, so you have all those Old Testament stories, right? A whole bunch of people doing stuff for God, for the nations, and they're like, but wait, we're supposed to have a Savior that's going to help us, the Jews? And he's like, nah, I'm going to help the, everybody. And they're like, oh, man. Um, so the next thing, Mars Hill, Paul, um, Acts 17. So we, the, the title in the Bible is, I, I can't even pronounce it, Aerophagus. And I, so Mars Hill just sounds cooler. It's one of those places that, but what did, what did Paul actually do there? He goes, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. That's cool. And honestly, if you're trying to figure out how to talk with someone, even here in Idaho, ask them what, they, what their faith is. Even if it's in science, it's a faith in science. Um, ask them what they believe. And if, it's, if they disagree, I just was visiting Austria again, and I had forgotten Austrians, they have a conversation, a friendly, loving conversation, by finding what they disagree on. Americans, to make a conversation, you find things that you agree on. Oh, you like sports too. What team? Oh, okay. Well, we disagree on the team, but you like sports. Cool. And you find things that you have in common. Whereas in Austria, because they're monocultural, they find stuff that they don't have in common, and then they relish the fight. And then they get into each other's hair, and they're like, ah, and five hours later, you're like, oh. And I had forgotten all about that. But these guys, the Jews, loved that kind of conflict. Maybe that's why Austria is that way, because they had a huge Jewish population for a long time in history. Um, and so he finds his inscription, and he, it's, it says, To the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And half the time, we might need to literally approach it that way. You've heard about God from your prejudice about Christians, but let me introduce you to the God that saved my heart and my life. And that will change the story. And here's the crazy part. Um, outside we have my, one of my yearbooks, and we used album covers from, from pop culture, and we can argue and disagree on, on, on is that even okay to use something that's a reference to, like, we have a Taylor Swift cover inside, don't say anything. Um, but here's the thing, Paul then referenced a poet of their era, and the quote is, in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of our own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. So he's quoting their poetry to them but he's pointing to God in it all. And that's kind of cool. Another one that's not on the slide, but Thomas, the rumor has it, and the church history has it, that he went straight to East. And there, some people claim that there's records of him being one of the first missionaries to the Asian part of the world. And that's kind of cool. 
Another one, Acts 26, 40. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. So this one is another apostle. He's walking along the road, and he overhears this guy reading aloud um, Isaiah. And when he's reading Isaiah, what happens? He's like confused, like, wait a minute. Can you help me with this? Go over and join the chariot. He heard God speaking to him, saying, go and talk with this dude. And so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked him, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? Half the time, even in missions, and here too, it's not about just a way. Here too, you might find someone that's having struggle understanding something that's going on in their life, and they just need someone to come alongside them and be there for them. That's literally what most of missions is about, is giving someone a contact that can show them the hands and feet of God. Um, so it keeps on going, and we're going to skip the rest of that. But the eunuch, that's a really cool story. You guys should read that if you had time. All of Acts. Just read all of Acts one whole Sunday night, afternoon. Just read the entire thing in one, one sitting. And then here it actually finishes in verse 40 because it's on the next page. And Philip found himself in Azotus, and he passed through, and he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So he's going and hanging out with this eunuch, baptizes him, and he's like, oh, where am I? How do I end up here? Okay, well, I'll talk about God here. And then he goes back to Caesarea, which is kind of cool. So sometimes wherever you are is going to be your mission field. Now, there's another specific example. Um, has anybody here heard of the Moravians? one person, a couple people. They're, they're, a, they're like the prototype missionaries of the era. In 1700s, there was a guy named Count Niklas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Try to say that real quick out loud. Niklas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. And he, and I'm going to be really hazy on the backstory, whatever happened in his backstory, he actually was in a boarding school, and he was affected by, um, there's, there's several different groups that influenced him. He came to Christ, and then he started a community called the Moravians. Um, you might have heard of Herrenhut. Um, if you hear of the Moravians, there's even a college to, to, of the Moravians in the U.S. Um, and they established a town close to the German-Czech border. And it's just, these are some of the buildings still exist, actually, which is kind of cool. It's Germany, so something from the 1700s still exists, and it's a building that didn't fall apart. Um, so close to the German-Czech border, Herrenhut, and there are still people in that region that trace their roots to this guy. And they could do, they basically, the basic summary of them, I think you can go to the next slide. The basic summary is that one of the ethos was to find a job that, that was needed or where someone wasn't reached in and do that job. There's even a guy that sold himself into slavery to reach slaves of a certain people group. Like, they would do the jobs that were needed to be with those people because back then, you didn't have supported missionaries. And ironically, the world is moving into that direction. It's going to have to be everybody just doing everything to talk about God everywhere. And maybe that's one of my side points that I didn't actually flesh out in that sense. But literally, everybody doing everything everywhere and, and support as much as missions has relied on it the last 50 to 100 years— it, with government restrictions, who knows where that's going to go. Um, and then, one of the things that I loved about the Moravians, I heard this on a little snippet, and I couldn't find the actual source for it right now, but they started their own mailing system just to do what Paul did and bring the information back of what was happening on the field. So they started their own postal service that then was actually used by others as well just to communicate, God is doing this in this town. God is doing this in this town and in, in, in somewhere across the world. And that's kind of cool. Um, I'm going to just throw out a bunch of names. If you hear one that you've heard of, great. If there's one that you didn't hear of, maybe watch the video again later and then research that person. Hudson Taylor went to China. He had a whole really cool backstory. Gladys Day Award. My parents had, had soundtracks. I mean, tape, tapes. Does anybody remember tapes? We would listen to tapes. And, and one of them was Gladys Albert, and it was a story about her and, and orphanages that she worked in. And she also ended up having government impact because of this, the services that she provided that then actually were under government auspice. Um, Jim Elliott, you guys might be familiar with because we have MEF pilots, and the MEF is here in town. So those stories, 
all of those seem like, oh, those are amazing. But those are just the tip of the iceberg or the tip of the spear in that case. <laughs> um, but they're just the, the big stories. In reality, the little stories are what make the difference. Eric Liddell, um, he was a missionary kid to China, and back then, boarding wasn't just a couple years in high school. It was your entire life was in England while your parents were in China. He was at a boarding school from the age of eight or something all the way through. He went in and out of China too, like summers or whatever, but it, you would be gone and not see your parents for several years. And that's not anymore. But he went back to China. He was an athlete. And one of the phrases he was, and I'm just quoting this from memory because I didn't look for the actual quote. Um, when he was running, he would share that he runs because he feels God's pleasure in him doing that. And then he would share about how God has impacted him and how he saved him from all this stuff, even though he's a missionary kid. Um, Corey Tim Boom came to mind yesterday when I was trying to summarize all this. You don't necessarily know if you're going to become a missionary. Sometimes you just become someone serving God. And she was a Dutch watchmaker that then hid Jews in the Holocaust. Um, and then who here knows Maria van Trapp? Actually, Marla knows. <laughs> there shall be unnamed why. Um, so Sound of Music. I read the, the actual uh, biography of hers, and it's, her story's weirder than the movie. She went into, into education. Then she was like, God's calling me to take care of these kids. Oh, wait, I have to be married to do that? And then in all those situations, later on, they went to uh, Vermont, but then she became a missionary to Papua New Guinea for several years. She was one of the first women to go to a, a recently safer tribe, and she asked them, how is eating human? Is, how is cannibalism? And they're like, it tastes like chicken. That's the, one, that's the thing I remember from it. Anyway, don't quote me on that one. But she has, she has these missionary roots, and that's Maria from Trap. You just know her as a device, a device, right? You don't think of, you never would expect her to be an actual missionary. She did all kinds of really cool stuff. But that was along her journey of being a Catholic, like all Austrians are, then becoming charismatic, and then finding, I, I'm not sure what denomination she ended up in, but, but she ended up talking about God and living a life in that sense. All right, so what's the current state of this world? Um, you can go to these next slides and maybe toggle a bit back and forth. This one is from 1900s, and go to the next one. And that's 2000s. That's the growth of Christianity since um, the 1900s and the 2000s. So go back to the first one. Go back to the next one. All right. That's Christians in general. But then the last two slides, the next two slides, are Protestants. So ones that are actually actively claiming them to be, like, active Christians. And so that's kind of a sadder picture because it's not as much as we think, right? Um, and that's the growth and you see where the big circles are? Where are those? The global south. It's not here. And they're sending missionaries to, to Europe. They're sending missionaries to America. They're sending missionaries all over the place. Missions is not one direction anymore. It's all over the place. Okay, on um, the next slide, um, the Joshua Project one, the one that's after those four. This one... You can't see it. Well, actually, you can see it really good up there. I can't see it up there. The red dots are unreached people groups. There's a whole little dichotomy of what it means to be unreached. You guys can go to the Joshua Project website. There's all kinds of breakdowns on, on how this is identified. You can go by country. Oh, wait, we've identified this people group. They've never heard about Jesus. Or this people group has never heard about Jesus. It's not about even economics because there's another one of these. Austria, where I was a missionary kid to, is still red. You'd be like, well, they're in the West. How do they not count as reached? Because a lot of people, they live in a Christian country and don't connect to Christianity anymore at all. Um, no matter what missionaries are trying to do, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't go there. Actually, that means we should go there. Um, so that's the next one. You can go to the next slide. So what's God doing around the world today? And here I'm going to just share some anecdotal stories. Some of them are from my own experience. I was just at a 70-year anniversary of these Jance brothers that started by accident Black Forest Academy. And there's a lot of people there that were sharing some stories 
And, and since I didn't <laughs> actually ask them, I'm just going to paraphrase the entire thing. And I also asked several people that are in my, in my environment at Black Forest Academy, these other mission boards, what do you actually do? And that's going to be, in some ways, the summary of what Paul's asking. What is going on in the world, and how can you be blessed by that? Because it's so cool to see, and we're back to the career day at school. Um, these people have just followed the call to the nations, like the Moravians did. And because I work at Black Forest Academy, it's almost like an air airport to, to what we see around the world. Like, people come in, it's like, oh, I just finished this tr trip to, to Greece to helping with the refugees, and, and we just brought a bunch of stuff to Ukraine, and now we're back. Or there's all this in and out stuff going on. Um, there's pilots. They're, they're um, min m sending mis material to hard-to-reach places, running camps. Wait, Warm Lake is a camp too, but you can do camps in, in France, right? And reach French kids that would never go to a church, but they'll come to a camp. Um, my son goes to one of the German-English camps that they have, um, teaching languages. Um, there's a guy in our town, their son goes to our school, but they're building a translation app that will do instant translation to any language you pick. Um, so if, let's say someone that speaks Farsi came to church here, you guys don't have a translation service. You don't need one. There's an app they could just sign in on. You might pay the subscription or whatever. I don't know how it works. They're still building this thing. And I think there's a subscription base, but it's, it's an outreach. And they, you could give them this little gadget or their own phone, put on earbuds, and they could listen to me speaking live in Farsi. It's so cool. But that someone had to learn code to be able to write the app. And does that sound like a normal missionary? He didn't do Bible study, and he didn't go to theological seminary. But he's reaching the lost through an app. Um, starting schools. So a lot of Jansas now teach beyond, and they do a lot of school outreach and BFA is part of that. They're, they're technically were funded and started by Teach Beyond. Um, representing minorities. There's a lot of missionaries that because of where they're at, they find a need and see a need, and they're not stuck in the cultural situation. So they're like, wait a minute, I can help you fix this. And, and it's, people nowadays have struggled with the word colonialism. Actually, there's a lot of research to show that missionaries independently actually fight against colonial stuff. They're actually opposed to those kind of things. So when you drill down, if it's state-sponsored church, it might be part of colonial issues, and that's really bad. And historically, there are issues with that. But when it comes down to individuals, typically missionaries are actually on the side of the abused and the minorities and the needy and the poor. And that's contrary to what colonialism would be about. Um, she mentioned, um, Deborah mentioned that the videos there in our school, it, it, we've had students whose parents were working at Gemstone Media. And they just um, recently put out a movie. It was basically a retelling of the, the prodigal son. And they did it all in Kosovo with Kosovo, I don't know how do you say Kosovonians, <laughs> with actors from that country. And some of them weren't even Christian, and they reenacted this story, but in a modernized version, and without direct reference to the Bible. And then it got all kinds of awards. Then they did one in, in one of the stands, I'm not sure which one, and they used people from those tribes to tell another biblical story. And they have this huge um, outreach with that. Sometimes you might be, ooh, I'm a finance guy. Well, what if you were to help the finances of a mission board and you need to be in country because you need to understand the country issues that are there? So you might be finance, you might be visa. You might just be a money guy. And you can say, I can help my missionaries keep track of their finances. Um, Engineering Missions Incorporated. Actually, I studied mechanical engineering before I got into graphic arts. And I dropped it because I didn't realize I could be a missionary that was an engineer until I heard of emission, Engineering Missions Incorporated. They're missionaries that design and build plants to water desalination or whatever, and then other churches can go and build those plants that they design. And you can be a missionary as an engineer. So you can go travel to India, figure out what they need there, build and design the thing, and then let someone else build it for them. So those are a couple things. I'm going to even excel even more, accelerate even more. Um, just looking at this list, I'm not going to... I mean, you guys read this list today as a homework assignment and pray for someone. Find one of these people on this list and pray for them. Talk with them today after church. If you don't meet them today after church, figure out what their contact information is and say, I'm praying for you. It doesn't have to be Freddie all the time. Just because he's ahead of the missions thing doesn't mean he can pray for all of these people. You guys can pray for them. And that's just a few. 
right? There's hundreds of missionaries. You guys might know someone that's a missionary somewhere and say, I want to support you, not just pray for you. I want to support you in all kinds of ways. Um, the, we need to, be rem to remember that in all our prayers, because like in the Old Testament and in the early church, sometimes there was conflict with the local governments. So there, there, is, there is a prayer need there too because be, we are foreigners in these countries and there are sometimes conflicts with the, with the government or because of visas and how do we wisely accommodate for that or, or work through that? And that's where Esther and Mordecai and all these guys come to mind. It's nothing new. All these same things that happened back then are happening now. Um, all right, what can you do? Now this is where it gets gritty. Um, what did Pastor Brett say last week about, um, in the message, it was about the body of Christ, and another big standout was giftings. And so I was like, what am I going to preach on? He just talked about everything. Um, but that's really what it's about. It's like finding how you can use your talents for God. Um, and then there's another point, I think, yes, passport picture. Okay, this one, that's my passport, and I, I, I could only get in here with that passport. I couldn't fly across the country without that thing, right? What passport do you have if you become a Christian? You're a citizen of heaven now. You are part of the kingdom of God. And we, it wasn't until a couple years ago, and I guess I always have this passport, and, I, and technically I'm supposed to carry it on me at all times in Germany. I, I can usually get away with it because I'm fluent in German, but um, we forget that, that if you wave a passport, sometimes that can get in trouble, but sometimes it can get you out of trouble too. We have privileges and rights with that thing, but there's, there's you know, which, which country is the safest passport to have, and that list is constantly changing, and America's kind of dropping a bit right now. But um, the passport to, to citizenry in heaven, you'll end up like, like the apostles saying, no, here we stand, or Luther, here I stand. And you can trust in God because you are, well, and that's, this is the scary part, technically you're an ambassador for that passport. Oh, those Christians, they're acting weird again. And you, be aware of that. Sometimes we're going to echo on to people, but sometimes we're going to be a blessing to people. Um, we're technically not of this world. We have this new citizenship, and it comes with all kinds of rights and responsibilities. And again, it's not a passport to the U.S. Some people, oh, the Christian nationalists. No, this has nothing to do with Christian nationalism. This is literally you realizing these are just other states on the planet, and we're part of this big globe that's spinning through the galaxy, and it's in God's hand. I always, I love that reference. Talk to me about God's hand later. Um, are we living this out? Are we considering every day that there's a mission field to go to? So what is missions? Is it, is it just someone out there, or is it literally our calling for everybody? It said J Jerusalem, where did it go? I'm going to quote it wrong. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. It's all of them. It's not one is more important than the other. They're all important. You guys just get the double duty. You get to support some people that can't do it financially there and be doing it here. So actually, in some ways, you guys have it. You have a bigger challenge almost because you're doing two things, and that's kind of amazing, and I can't even describe how grateful, and as a missionary kid, it's sometimes you forget how, how much we have relied on gifts of other people to be where we were, and even though we're just starting out in our relationship with um, First Baptist, it's amazing to see how sacrificially people have been giving for these last hundreds of years to missions in America. And it's, it's amazing, and I can't say thank you enough. So what else can you do? You could talk with the missionaries. You could invite people to Warren Lake Camp. It's awesome. I was there two years ago. It's amazing. Apparently, once you go, you can never leave. Um, and, and so if you've not decided to, to help at the camp yet, you should. It's awesome. Um, you can support a specific missionary. You can, so some go, some stay, but the field is no longer just there. It's literally here. Um, there's a phrase, one of the missionaries once asked, well, what if we can't get into an Arab country? And they, they said, and this is before all the refugees started coming, it's like, well, then God will send them to us. And sure enough, they're coming, right? You, if we can't make it there, he's going to send them to us. Um, remember the Moravians. Sometimes it's going to be your job. You might not need to change anything you're doing to be a missionary. 
You can just keep on doing what you're doing, but realize, wait a minute, that guy looks really troubled right now. How can I show God's heart to that person? Ask him, how are you doing? And just pray for them. I mean, sometimes it's, it's weird if people pray for other people, and I, even I'm, as a pastor, kid, weirded out by that sometimes, but you can pr- silently pray for them. Maybe they'll come to you and say, can you pray for me? Joseph in the prison? He wasn't tr- looking to evangelize to this baker and then the other, the, the, the wine taster. It, it just happened. And then, guess what? You guys live in the Treasure Valley. I'll pull out the, where is your treasure? What is the most important thing in your life? And think about that, and it might adjust how you act around people around you. Last thought, and I'm getting close to getting kicked out of here. Um, Matthew 24, 14, um, the signs of the end of the age. I like that Pastor Brett brought that up. It's literally what happens, we don't know when the end times are coming. And so, just look at that whole Matthew 24 passage. Read that again sometime. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed through the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And he said that, and then he disappeared. So Jesus is like, what? Wait, what? Cliffhanger. And he's like, hi, bye, guys. And, like, and then I'll send what? The Holy Spirit. My dad mentioned this um, yesterday. He's like, make sure they realize this isn't about human efforts. It's about the Holy Spirit working in humans that then move. It's, we aren't doing this alone ever. Um, I'm just going to close it there. Let me pray and listen to some of the accounts that the missionaries are here because you don't always get that chance. Like, and then try to get their contact or get yourself on their lists, and then they can share with you what's going on on their day-to-day basis. I mean, my wife and I struggle with that, so if you, and I bet other missionaries do too because they get so busy doing what they're doing Write them and say, how are you doing? And then they go, oh, wait, dude, I'm doing okay, or it's not so hot right now, and encourage them. And then they'll probably ask you, how can I pray for you? Because you might not be doing so hot either. And I'll pray for that, and I'll let you guys go to the luncheon. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for this church. Thank you for their focus on missions, and thank you for the opportunity to share what God is doing around the world and with each individual here, too. Um, bless this church, um, and bless your kingdom. In your name, amen. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing a song called Is He Worthy, and it's a, a wonderful response to the sovereignty of our Lord and Savior. The world looks broken, but he is the one that heals. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Does 
Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the soul? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? Sufficient merit, shining like the sun, a fortune I inherit by no work I have done. My righteousness I forfeit at my Savior's cross. Well, all sufficient merit did what I could not.
the joy of my salvation shall be my final breath when i stand accepted before the throne of god i'll gaze upon my jesus and thank him Thank you for this, your day, that we get to give thanks that uh, you send out the workers, Father. And I pray that we would be recognizing that it is nothing that we can do on our own, but only the, the power of the Holy Spirit, through God our Father, through Jesus Christ, his Son, are we able to, to share the good news. And so, Lord, I pray that we would lean on your merit and not ours. Thank you for this day. In your precious name we pray. Amen. And I think we've got some instructions coming, so go ahead and have a seat. There's a lot going on in between Sunday school, after Sunday school, all that good stuff. Am I on? I'm on. You've heard the statement that there is no free lunch, <laughs> but that's not true. Today, there is a free lunch. And we planned on you coming. Even if you're a first-time visitor, we counted on you being here and enjoying the lunch with us. There is a little bit of a gotcha, though. You've got to go to Sunday school first and then come back for the lunch. While you're in Sunday school, we will have um, some men come up and move all the chairs out, put tables in, set the tables, put food on the tables, so that when you come back from Sunday school, you can sit down and, and enjoy a meal. Now, before you take off, though, there are a couple of things that I need to uh, tell you about what's going to happen. Um, the children are going to go to the normal classroom area, and they will be joined by Angie and um, Jerry Burheim. Would you stand up, Angie and Jerry? They're here. <clears throat> the youth are going to go to their normal Sunday school area, and they will be joined by Ethan Decker. Ethan, stand up where you are. He's back there, okay? <clears throat> Gary Johnson needs about 20 men to help bring tables up. So if some of you would meet in the back corner back there when I, get, when I dismiss you, um, then I'll have you help. You won't get to go to Sunday school, but the rest of you will. So. Everybody else is going to go downstairs. There are four areas where there are going to be missionaries talking, and I'm going to describe those areas for you. Don't go to your normal Sunday school class. Go to one of those other areas and listen to someone that you haven't had a chance to hear yet, okay? So uh, one of those individuals is um, Beth Williams. Beth, would you stand up? She's back in the back corner, and she's going to be in the classroom that is off of the elevator in that hall off of the elevator, okay? Um, Annie McKeith is going to be in the classroom that is in the middle off of the fellowship hall. Annie, would you stand up? Annie's back there, okay? Uh, Kirk and Juanita McKeith will be in the classroom that is opposite the drinking fountain and the restrooms. Um, Kirk and Juanita are standing back in the back, okay? And then Chris, that you already know, is going to be in the fellowship hall. So choose one of those to go visit. Make sure that those rooms are full so that they have an audience to listen to. While you're there, you're going to be praying for some missionaries, not just the ones that came today, but the ones that we have, that we represent all the time. Chris alluded to that, that we should be praying for them. You're gonna have an opportunity to do that during the classroom time. 
and then those missionaries will have a time to talk there as well. We hope to have this set up in about 40 minutes, but at any event, we'll ring the bell. When we ring the bell, parents, go pick up your children, come up and, and sit, everybody else come up, and we'll be directed to a, a spot to sit. Any questions? Go for it.